us this morning for our first uh, Friends of the Greenway Discovery Series. Um, we hope to be out here with you in person, uh, but we appreciate you being here with us virtually. Um, I'm Brian Myers, I'm our Advancement Manager with the Greenway. Um, I work a good bit with our Friends group, um, and we're joined here by Andy Kane. Andy Kane is a land steward uh, for the Catawba Land Conservancy, um, and he's also on our Natural Resources um, Committee. And Andy, uh, we're out here in the Schweine Sunflower Prairie. Um, he's going to take us around, tell us about some different plants, um, insects, bugs, uh, and then we're going to walk down to the creek and, and learn a little bit more about there. Um, but before I turn it over to Andy, um, I just wanted to thank our friends group um, so for all your support over the past few months. Um, the friends has always been a special group um, to the Greenway, uh, and you guys continue to prove that over these last few months. Um, Andy is actually uh, has been a friend since uh, its, its inception, um, so always been a big part of the Greenway, uh, and we're excited to have him out here uh, with us and, and, and learn a lot. So thank you, Andy. Thank you, Brian. Delighted to be here again. Looking forward to a nice walk on the prairie. Um, today, like Brian said, we're going to take a little walk. We're going to look at some plants, talk about the importance of, of ecosystems like this. Uh, some people would call this a prairie. Some would say a meadow or even a savanna. So we're going to talk a little bit about the differences in those three items. But today I also want to stress the importance of native plants in your landscape. So I'll be talking about some great plants that you could use in your home, uh, garden, or if you have a larger piece of property, some of the cool things that you could do there to, to get by. When we were walking down this morning, uh, Brian, walking down the road, we noticed uh, some nice bluebirds that were out here working in the prairie. Uh, some beautiful dragonflies are out here early. Uh, in the prairie, and one of the one of the cool things uh, about this this type of uh, uh, land is that the dragonflies you'll see them working this field just like they will a pond, and they go back and forth over a pond, Brian, because they're collecting insects. They have their arms are, are shaped like this, and they scoop them up and they go and, and rest and, and eat them. They do the same thing on this prairie. Um, the, the interesting thing about a prairie or a meadow is it's an area that has a tremendous diversity of plants, especially in this part of the world. In the southeastern United States, we are blessed with a huge volume of uh, vascular plants that survive in our woodlands and in fields. Unfortunately, we have really subdued this type of habitat. This is also called early successional habitat. And uh, if you look out here, what, what this field is naturally trying to do is to convert back to a forest. And early successional habitat was a very common feature of the landscape uh, back two or 300 years ago. Even when I was uh, a younger man. It was a more common type of habitat. And uh, the reason is that people would have fields uh, on their farm and they'd let them go for a couple of years and they just didn't manage them as intently as they do now. The other thing that's changed on a lot of farm fields is the introduction of uh, non-native grasses like fescue and Bermuda. And then some of the weedy grasses that have also been tried and proven to be uh, more of a problem than, than a help, even to farmers, like the Johnson grass. Um, this is a, a little persimmon tree that's is trying to struggle up and, and grow. It uh, does very well in, in these kind of rough, early successional areas. Um, it needs full sunlight, so this is what it needs is an area like this. We're managing this property so that this property never gets above the early successional stage. In other words, we are either burning or bush hogging this property on an annual basis to make sure that it doesn't go into a forest. Why is that significant? 
it's significant because the number of species of plants and particularly insects that are growing out on this prairie area are, are exponentially greater than what you would find in a forest. And this type of habitat in close proximity to a forest creates a very rich environment for a number of different uh, plants, or not plants, but animals, especially insects. In any place that you get an abundance of insects, you're also going to get an abundance of songbirds going in and work, working the insects. And uh, consequently, you'll get a lot of field mice that will come out here because there's tremendous volume of uh, seeds and berries on an environment like this. And uh, that makes good food for a lot of different creatures. And also this, this type of fleshy vegetation that we have here that I can't even pull up and I'm trying to. This is some uh, goldenrod that will, that will uh, bloom later in the season. And almost all of these goldenrod, you can see that they're gnawed down. They've been browsed by deer. And deer will come out here uh, in the early morning and uh, in, this, in this area, they'll come out here just about any time of day and uh, browse on this woody vegetation, I mean non-woody vegetation. So there's a lot of good food out here, not just for uh, insects, but also for grazing animals. Areas like this, Brian, were maintained in large part uh, in early America by, by buffalo. We had a lot of woodland buffalo that lived in this area, and uh, they were pretty quickly killed off by the early settlers. And, but these were smaller buffalo than you would have seen out west, but it's an extinct subspecies of the, of the buffalo that we're used to, to seeing. Andy, if this, if this area was left unmanaged, how long would it take over time to become forest? That's a great question. This. This, uh, this part of the country is really rich. We're, we're blessed with an abundant amount of rainfall here and long growing seasons. This area in uh, about five years, you wouldn't be able to walk from here to that woods over there. It would be up in about 15 feet of just heavy brush that would consist of a lot of woody vegetation, but also uh, a lot of this herbaceous stuff will start getting big too. So it would be an unhospitable place for people, and it would start to degrade in its quality for wildlife uh, as time goes on. In 20 years, this would be a, a, a young forest. So you'd be walking out, walking out through the forest. So uh, we're going to look at a couple of plants here, right, right beside us, Brian. These are these are some asters that are blooming, and they bloom fairly early in the season. Uh, there are a lot of asters that are well suited for the home landscape. Um, this is a nice little aster, sort of purple flowers with uh, yellow centers. And uh, when we were here a little while ago, the, I saw some little native bees that were working these. Um, one thing that we have really heard a lot about is the decline of the European honeybee in our landscape. That is true, and uh, it's true for a number of reasons. But one thing we don't talk about or think about too much is the decline of other pollinating insects. We have over 560 native bees in the Carolinas, and they are on a precipitous decline in their population due to the way we manage land, uh, the way we manage our home landscapes, and um, also the, the use of indiscriminate use of, of pesticides. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but the native bees are very important. And one of the reasons honeybees have gotten so important is that we don't have a lot of these rough areas that, that native uh, bees can survive in because they need a multitude of different plants for survival. Each of those bees might even be, a lot of those bees are adapted to just a few different native plants to survive. So um, I know when we were kids, we used to call them sweat bees. That was one of the little bees that come in. And sometimes they'll give you a little sting that's almost more like an itch than a sting. So uh, we're, 
we're going to walk down the way just a little bit, but before we do that, I want to show this little central area. This is a little aster. There are a lot of these that are blooming out in the uh, landscape here right now. These are, uh, there are some cultivated center area, and uh, this is a, a native species that's doing very well. I think it's also called knapweed. Uh, it can get a little bit weedy in some areas, but it's a beautiful plant. And you can see all these, these purple flowers are great for pollinating insects to go in and capture some, some nectar and pollen for their, their survival. All right, right over here, um, Brian, you would never think this if you didn't, weren't familiar with this plant. You, you know this one? This is uh, a fairly common plant. That is the, um, I have no idea. Queen Anne's Lace. And Queen Anne's Lace has an umbel type flower, which is a nice flat landing platform for uh, a lot of different insects. And the Queen Anne's Lace is a biannual. It takes two years for it to, to flower. And um, actually it's just a wild carrot is what it is. And if you smell the foliage, you can you can smell a little bit of, of carrot. Break it up real good. Can you smell carrot? Oh, yeah. So um, this is a non-native plant, but not not invasive, and it's actually pretty valuable to, to pollinating insects. There are some uh, swallowtails that use the uh, this family of plants, which is also the parsley family, to lay their eggs and the. Uh, the larva will depend on these plants for a food source. So the Queen Anne's Lace, I also call it the Queen Chigger's Lace because if you get in the uh, Queen Anne's Lace, you're in Chigger territory and you usually could uh, pick up a couple. All right, we're gonna roll on down the highway a little bit. native grasses, but also of scattered trees that grow uh, within the um, area. And that's a landscape that's very valuable for uh, wildlife because you can imagine a bird can come up here, hang out here, uh, scope the area, look for a big juicy grasshopper to eat, and then just swoop down and, and get a nice breakfast. Um, bluebirds, as most people know, magnificent place to see one of the most beautiful birds we have in the Carolinas and that's the indigo bunting. And if you're not familiar with an indigo bunting, look on your uh, uh, computer or in your bird book. It's a, a smaller bird than a bluebird and it's often confused with that but it's a, a, a more almost an iridescent blue. It's a magnificent bird. I'm surprised we haven't seen one yet. These uh, pine trees here, uh, it's too hard for me to tell exactly what it is, but I believe these are uh, shortleaf pines. And shortleaf pines are very tolerant to fire. Uh, you can see on the bark of this, this tree that it has had fire that's come up this high on the bark when uh, Josh and the Natural Resource Group has done control burns out here. Uh, the bark on the, the shortleaf pine, it's not worrying about a fire at all. It's adapted for living in these savanna type uh, environments. So the, the good thing for the pine is it, it controls woody vegetation that would compete with the pine for uh, sunlight and nutrients. So when there's a fire, the nutrients are immediately returned to the soil and made available to the plants that, that persist. So we like the short leaf pine. That's a, that's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, Brian, this area here, this is uh, early June. 
by August, a lot of this area will be about this thick. So if you can imagine the biomass of this property in uh, the late summer. And the biomass is just the, a, the accumulated weight, if you could actually do that, of all the living things on this, this property, on this uh, field. And that would include the, uh, the plants, the insects, the animals, and it, it gets exponentially larger as we go along. We, we captured, I, I was teaching Brian to capture insects with a net a minute ago. And we found, found lots of little grasshoppers that were that big. The grasshopper was that big and the antenna was that big. It's a longhorn grasshopper. And that grasshopper, those grasshoppers will get to be maybe this big. Some of them as long as four inches long. And they are excellent food for uh, different types of, of wildlife. One thing we don't, uh, as people necessarily think, are, are good creatures, but they're very important in the, in the environment. And those are, are field mice, different types of mammals that will rely on an environment like this. Really good for hawks and owls and snakes. And uh, so this is a critical environment for them. Brian, look over there at the forest you see down there on the edge. Mm -hmm. That's a really important interaction between this prairie and this forest. And you can see it's almost like a green wall on the edge. And what's happening is as um, the, the forest gets bigger, the field continues to be an open area, the trees will produce their leaves and branches all the way almost down to the ground. And that's good because it makes a great place. You can tell there that is um, maybe six feet off the ground, totally hidden. Mm -hmm. It can come out here and uh, do some nice hunting. Uh, we're also seeing out here a, a, a tree out in the middle of the, the, the prairie that we'll now call a savanna perfect place for the birds to go in and, and hang out. Um, we're also starting, oh, here's a, here's a little sparrow right here. I don't know if you can catch that, I think it is. Yeah. He, he's, he's looking for an easy meal out here early in the, early in the morning. So we're gonna walk on down here a little bit and see what else we can see. You talked about that this, you know, is gonna grow in through end of the summer. When does the management piece of it come in? When does it get cut back and what is, is that every year? Or? That's a really good point, uh, Brian. Um, these areas in the summertime, you think of them as being so important to uh, different types of creatures. But during the winter, they're also critical habitat for food, but also for shelter. So a lot of creatures will rely on this area. So you can imagine it being up about this, this high and thick. It's a great place for, for birds to hide out and uh, for different mammals, even reptiles to find holes and go down in. Nice, safe environment. So the, the burning or the bush hogging would happen late in the winter. And the later, the better because uh, songbirds really rely on this type of habitat for getting down in the duff and hiding out on those really cold, windy, rainy days. It's one of the safest place to be hiding from predators, but also be protecting yourself from, from the wind and the elements. This is that plant that we looked at last time, and it's even looking better now. I really encourage people to examine this plant for the home landscape. You would need a, a fairly large area for this. Look at the red venation on these. This is a sunflower, believe it or not. It, it's in the aster family. And it makes these really beautiful rosette leaves. It is a perennial, comes back every year. And then late in the summer, it will start, it's, it might not, not quite, but it'll make a nice long stalk of sunflowers that will get to be about six feet high. Beautiful little sunflowers. This is called silphium or rosin weed. And it's growing next to another plant that's really uh, a beautiful plant. It's related to milkweed 
and this is dog bane and it's probably called dog bane because if the dog chews on that it's got a it's got a real kind of milky latex to it like milkweed and it will uh, probably doesn't taste all that all that delicious so we're going to try and head down towards the creek now. Another wonderful tree for the uh, prairie or savanna. This is a uh, Quercus stellata. It's a, uh, a post oak. This would be a great tree for your home landscape. It's, it's got a habit somewhat like a live oak down in the, the low country. Extremely drought tolerant. It grows all the way out into the shelter belts of Kansas real deep rooted and uh, last time we learned about the importance of a leathery fuzzy leaf feel that uh brian it's leathery and it's yeah. fuzzy and both of those are good adaptations for uh, retaining moisture on those real hot dry summer days so uh, a post oak great landscape choice this is a great example of a tree it's a wonderful tree for the landscape. You can rarely find it in local nurseries. You have to go almost to a native plant nursery. And all you have to do is Google North Carolina, South Carolina native plant nurseries. And there are some excellent ones in the Carolinas where you can actually order plants and they'll ship them to you or you drive an hour or so and, and pick some up. Andy, if people were going to start converting some of their landscaping to native plants, is that where you would tell them to start? Yes, is that the good, nursery? Yes, that's a good place. And, and Elizabeth, there are also some excellent books now on creating a native plant um, uh, home landscape. Clemson University, which is our, our land grant agriculture school, they have a lot of great information on their website for converting your landscape into native plants. And I'm not talking about converting everything, but just introduce a couple of plants into your landscape every year, and uh, you'll, you'll be rewarded with learning about native plants and, and uh, uh, enriching your landscape and enriching your mind a little bit. There are two native plant nurseries that we use a lot, and that's the uh, Woodlanders down in Aiken, South Carolina and also Mellow Marsh Nursery over in Siler City, uh, North Carolina. Right over here, you can barely see it. This is a somewhat obscure uh, plant that most people would overlook. This is called Goat's Rue, and it is a legume. So of course we know from uh, fifth grade that legumes fix atmospheric nitrogen. It's this plant here, not this one. And um, it's got those nice little red, red flowers. That's a native plant. And it's right next to a plant that is not native. This is Lespedeza. And uh, our staff here at the Greenway is trying to reduce the population of Lespedeza invasive. On the plus column, it is a legume. So it builds up the uh, nitrogen in the soil. And there, oh, that's a nice little population of, of goat through right over here. That, that's as pretty as it gets. A real subtle, mm -hmm. a real subtle wildflower. Here's a, here's a uh, dragonfly. They're working the plants. You see them going from plant to mm -hmm. plant. See them what, probably looking for some little aphids or, or really small insects. Some of them are so small that we might not even be able to see them with our naked eye. And this is a little area, Brian, that was created uh, when they were doing some road work. It was dug out. It was kind of a borrow pit, so they borrowed some dirt. And now it's created a little, a little bit moister environment. And so you are going to start to see different plant communities show up in here that ordinarily wouldn't be on other areas. Um, when uh, 
from the time the first Europeans came until probably now, we probably lost the equivalent of three to five feet of topsoil on the uh, Piedmont. So you can imagine the topsoil being us uh, standing about this much higher. Now why did that happen? It happened because the Europeans came and they, they tried to farm this land the same way they did in Europe. And they didn't take into consideration the slope in a lot of cases and the highly erosive type of soil that we have here in the Piedmont. And it just sloughed down and filled up our streams and rivers with that topsoil. And uh, it took us many years to figure out how to uh, curtail this problem. And uh, one of the solutions was kudzu. And it really held the soil in, but it also, as we know, is a very invasive plant and uh, very difficult to get rid of. Let's walk on down to this area right here that we want to talk about, which is uh, advertised in our <laughs> our walk today. I'm not sure if we're going to make it all the way down. Now, now, right down here, Brian and Elizabeth, you see a big patch of grass that's growing here. And this is a very interesting type of grass. You see it right in the middle there, and it's, it's blooming now. And uh, it's already uh, been pollinated and it's, it's forming some seeds. And uh, this is called Eastern Gamma Grass. And gra Gamma Grass is considered the queen of the grasses because foraging animals love Gamma Grass. And if this was, if this was a cow pasture and there was Gamma Grass on it, it would be gone because they graze it down to, to nothing. If you look at these, you can start to see the kernels on here. These are the seeds, and they have a really neat little pattern. And they form those seeds like this. And this, pl this plant is a very close relative of a very important foodstuff, corn. So this is a, a corn relative. So Eastern Gamma Grass. And I'm not seeing any grazing on it right now, which is a little bit surprising. Maybe the deer aren't as fond of this as they are the uh, um, wildflowers that are in here. I do know that they eat a lot of the sunflowers that we grow out here, and uh, including the Schwanet sunflower, which is the reason that Josh and company has built this, this fence. So, um, do you want to go in? Do we have time? To yeah, go let's in? go into okay. overtime. All I think right. it'll be alright. We're on overtime. We're close. We're close. I want people to see this fenced in area because we didn't, we didn't make it down here last time. noticing that the sunflowers were were not growing uh, quickly enough because they were getting eaten by the deer and they were in danger of not even blooming uh, because of the deer. Um, so 
as an example, uh, right before they built this fence, we had some sunflowers here that were about that big. And I know on some of the areas where Schwanet sunflower grows in Gaston County, they're about four or five feet high on a real poor soil area. Just Elizabeth and I go in and look and you stay out because we don't want too many feet clapping around in here. So we'll just take a second. And we ask that the, we ask that the public not go in here because if you really don't know what it looks like, you could do some uh, damage. And we're going to walk gingerly in here. This is the rare threatened Schwanitz sunflower. It's got opposite branching, and once again, it's very fuzzy. On the top of it, it feels like five o'clock shadow on a man's whiskers, and on the bottom, it's, it's sort of like a, a very soft baby hair on the bottom. So it doesn't look all that impressive, and uh, Josh and his team, they get, keep the other competing vegetation down on here. But when these are in full growth, they will be about eight, 10 feet high and they'll be blooming late in the summer. So come down to this area in the late summer and see the Schwanet sunflowers. And the sunflowers are about that big. This, this plant is endemic to York County uh, Mecklenburg County and maybe one or two other counties in the world. So it is a, a threatened uh, species that is protected by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, that's all I have today. Thank you all for supporting the Greenway. We greatly appreciate your support and uh, come out and enjoy the Greenway. We're open for, for hiking and, and uh, social distancing and remind people where you are how we how we got down here all right we went in through the uh adventure center entrance near the field trial barn and if you just walk down that road and, and look at the prairie loop on your your map you will find uh this area but do stay out of this fencing area because it is a, a very sensitive area thank you great thank you